Um, here's a little mini tutorial that I've been promising for a while. Um, just talking about getting into 2D, uh, annotations, markers, line weights, all of that sort of thing. Um, and I thought the easiest way to do it was just to sort of show you. Um, let's sort of start with what you might need when you're going into 2D. And I'm assuming that you're doing your model in Rhino, you're going to create line work and then export that to something else um, like uh, Adobe Illustrator to set your line weights, tweak it, make it look nice. And then um, my process anyway is to then take the individual drawings that I've produced in Illustrator and then arrange them on pages in uh, Adobe InDesign, uh, which I find is a really useful tool for that. Um, but just for now, I'm, I'm just going to deal with going from Rhino to Illustrator. So there's a couple of kind of key layers that I always want to export when I'm going into Illustrator. Um, so you'll have uh, your, your straight up, your make 2D layer. So you'll probably have a clipping plane defined. Turn it on so we can see what we're doing, you know, select all of that, make 2D, generates the line work. With the make 2D, um, the, the options that I tend to use, um, I tend to maintain the source layers so that I have more control over what goes where. Um, you, up to you whether you want to use that. You can just do it um, by output layers and it will just dump them all in the same layer. Um, I generally group output. I don't usually use a scene silhouette, um, certainly not when I'm doing a plan or a section or something, but you can experiment with that. And I don't turn on clipping plane intersections. I do my, my cut uh, a different way. And uh, the reason for that is when you turn on clipping plane ex uh, intersections, um, it actually removes a bunch of lines from the regular uh, Make 2D. So I prefer to have everything there. So th this is the way that I do it. Um, so I'm not going to do that again. Um, and that's how, you know, that gives you your base line work. Then what you want to do is, and I've shown you this before, but it probably doesn't hurt to go through it again. I use an intersection operation to get my cut planes. And there's, there's a really good um, reason for this. Um, it's because I don't just want one, uh, one layer of cuts. What I actually want is I want some stuff, I've, I've, like I've got, I've got two layers that I've created. One is cut heavy and one is cut light. And I'll just select the elements I've got in cut heavy so you can see, uh, select objects. So you can see all of my structure is in the cut heavy layer. Um, and when we, cut, when we go into Illustrator, you'll see why that is. Um, this I want, to, these want, need to be super clear as cut lines in Illustrator. But then there are a bunch of other cut objects that are technically cut, but I don't want them as heavy, to read as heavy as this. And they're in my cut light layer. And I'll select them now. And you'll see they're all of the windows, basically. The door slats, the window slats, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I still want to use a slightly heavier line weight in Illustrator with those, but not as heavy as the structural cuts. So what I do, and the way I get those two layers is, is I create a clipping plane at the same height as my um, as my clipping plane. So that's that's an intersect plane that's at the same height. So you want to make sure it's at the same height as your, your clipping plane so that it matches your make 2D. 
then what you want to do is let's start by selecting everything and then I'm going to turn a few things off. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to turn off uh, my mirror, stainless steel, painted FC. So anything that's sort of not main structure. So my doors, I'm going to turn off the timber. I want to keep my stainless steel tubes in the heavy cut layer, so I'll leave them on. Uh, don't need the nylon support. Uh, I'm going to turn off oops, all of my windows. And that should leave me with most of the stuff I want. So now I'm going to do an intersect two sets. Uh, yep. The stuff I've selected is my first intersection group. My plane that I've created is my second intersection group. Ooh, that's interesting. Why did it give me all of those dimensions? That's a bit weird, all right? Let's just try that again. Oh, I must have had them selected. Okay. So let's turn off all my grid and annotation and all of that junk. So we just have the 3D stuff. Let's try again. Bear with me. I'm doing this on the fly. This is not particularly planned. So let's turn off. Oh no, I've already turned off all those layers. Okay, cool. So let's try again. So uh, intersect two sets. Second set. That's better. So what we have here, you'll see, if I just move that up, is all of those structural elements. All of the, the, the sort of stuff that I want to show with a nice heavy line in my, uh, in my drawing. So... there and now I'm going to do the opposite. I'm now going to turn on those other elements and now I'm just going to select them. So I'm going to select oops, I want to select the windows, I'm going to select my timber, I'm going to select my mirrors and my timber my painted FC and that should be about all I need. Select those objects and now I'm going to do the intersect two sets again with my plane and now I have a second set of cut objects. Now I need to position those correctly. So let's just move you into the right spot there. And then I would go and position those over the top of all of my Make 2D stuff, which, I've, as you can see, I've already done that down here. So once you've done that, um, there are a few other things I would get ready for exporting as well. Um, I want my grid. So my grid is already 2D, so I don't need to do a, a Make 2D on that. I can get rid of that plane now. So, you know, I just select all my grid elements and the dimensions that I've done and move them into place over here as well. Um, and one last thing 
Oh, and I've drawn my door swings in here. Um, you could do them in Illustrator if Illustrator you find easy to do, but I find this stuff easier to do in Rhino. So I drew on all my door swings and they're in a layer called door swings, grids in grid. Um, and the last thing I do is I want, there are some things that I want as overhead lines. So I want my inner, I want to see my inner ring beams. I want to see my, my uh, door heads. Um, and I personally decided that I also wanted to see the extents of my roof. So I've just done a make 2D on the roof and then drawn the extents of my roof in over here. To get the other, to get the other stuff, the, the overhead stuff, you do it exactly the same way as you do with this. You do your make 2D, but you only select the bits you want. So we'll come in here and this is the 3D model. I'll select my ring beam. And I'll select that. And I want my door head. So I select that. And this is these are this is in 3D. If I just um, this is on the 3D model, not the 2D stuff. So select the door heads. I traced my roof on here. Uh, I'll just do the other door heads. Y, yes, U, U, U. And then I just do a make 2D on those elements. And now this is with the clipping plane turned off so that uh, you get those. Those are above the clipping plane. So if your clipping plane was turned on, you wouldn't normally see them. Um, and I've, I'll have i create a, a layer for that and I'll just call it you know, make 2D overhead or whatever. And when I apply that, it then creates 2D line work for those overhead items. Now I'll go ahead and make them dashed. Uh, you don't have to do that here. You can do that in uh, in Illustrator, and then I move them into place on there. And once again, I've already done that, so I'm not going to do it again. So the layers I have in my set here, ready to go into Illustrator, I've got uh, my cut heavy, which are those elements. I've got, whoops, I've got cut light, which are, whoops, cut light, which are all my windows and door slats and things. I have door swings in a layer. And having all of these, and you'll note I've put the door swings on the, on the cubicle doors as well. And the reason for having all these in different layers is it makes it much easier when you go into Illustrator to just apply a line style or something to a whole group of lines. So I can say, all my overhead lines are like this, all my door swings are like that, all my cut heavies are like this, etc., etc. Um, I have a grid is here, so you've seen that. And then there are there's a set of layers which are my make 2D layers, which are just all the, all the other bits and pieces, the toilet, the floor, the sink, all of that, the, the other line work. Um, the only other thing I'd probably do here that I haven't in this case, um, but I would if I was doing this again, is I would put all my X's on my structural elements. So, you know, I'd, I'd just go to the trouble of you know, and I would create I would create a, a a layer for this, and I would say cut X or something like that. Um, and once again, you only need to do these in your structural elements, not in all of the window slats. So basically, anything that's in cut heavy, um, you'll want to put an X through. So all of the wall structure your joiner posts and your little outer cover posts. And then we go ahead and 
we select all that stuff file export selected and we export it as an Adobe Illustrator file um, one thing to note is if you have all of your stuff off to one side of your main model and your main model is centered when you bring it into Illustrator it'll all be hanging off the page um, if you want it in the middle of the page or if you can't find it in Illustrator just move the whole lot to the origin hide all of your 3d stuff or even copy it into a new Rhino file put it at the center at the origin and save it out from there um, while we're in here I'll just show you a few things I've made up a set of standard markers um, that I'll give you guys both as a Rhino, Rhino file and as an Illustrator file that you can then use to put in your own files. These are just standard architectural markers. These are the way I do sections, elevations, internal elevations. I'll explain these a bit more in a sec. We'll go into Illustrator. Oh, one last, last thing, um, you'll want a north point. But the question is, all right, so how do I figure out which way is north? You know, I've drawn it like this, but north is actually sort of somewhere over here. Um, what the easiest way I've found to do this, and this is, you know, pretty quick and simple, if you don't have a survey that's got a north, north point on it, is just go to something like Google, Google Maps. Um, find our site which is here somewhere George's Heights Frenchies near Frenchies so that's it there um, go to your satellite view so we can see our building and then just take a screenshot of that um, while I'm here I'll show you a better map site for aerials and other stuff than Google Maps called six maps and it's for it's run by the um, New South Wales spatial services so it's only New South Wales but if we zoom in you'll see the aerial photos are generally higher resolution and quite often newer uh, where's our site here it is somewhere here yep there it is so you'll see that's actually a much better photo than Google Maps. Um, the other thing that Six Maps also has is you can add a bunch of layers to it. So we can go to Map Contents and I can put, uh, let's see, Lot Boundaries on. And it shows me all of the boundaries. Um, and this is great when you're doing something that's a bit more of an urban scale or putting together a DA or something. Uh, you guys pro probably won't use it so much yet, but valuable once you, you get out into the real world. Anyway, that's digressing a bit. Um, what you do to find your north point, you can see north is always up the page in these mapping um, websites. So just take a screenshot of our building then go into your Rhino file. I've got my screenshots here. Drag that screenshot in. Does that work? Drag the screenshot in. Come on, work. Why aren't you working? There we go. Just save it as a picture and then you just draw it on. Whoops, let's make it sort of reasonably big and just shove it off to one side. And then I grab my north marker, I move it onto the edge of my picture, select the north marker and the picture, and then rotate Sort of find the edge, rotate the whole thing so it's upright along with your north marker. So 
so that it matches how we've drawn it. And actually I've rotated that wrong. Let's do that again because I've drawn it with the entry down and here is the entry here. So we have to rotate again. Select objects to rotate. We want the north marker and the picture. Rotate from here to there. So you'll see the orientation of the building in the picture matches the orientation of, of the drawing I'm exported, exporting. I can delete the picture and then now down here, my north point is pointing in the right direction for my drawing. So that's, that's a sort of a quick and dirty way to get the right north point just from a mapping website. And so what I'd do is I'd sort of put that somewhere in my drawing and then when I export, I'd export all of this. Um, so once we've exported, we then go into Illustrator. Now I've done a little bit of work on this. It's not finished yet, but um, it's basically the same set of line work. You can see my layers. There's a few more here because I've added a bit more but mostly the layers are the, the same as what I brought in from Rhino. Um, what I, you can see that if I zoom in, my cut heavy objects, these ones, are all in a nice heavy line weight. My cut light lines are heavier than my uncut lines, but not as heavy as my cut heavy lines. My X's are light. So just to sort of give you an idea of what line weights I use, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll email you along with the, um, all of the symbols, I'll email you just this list of what I use for um, my line weights. Um, we've sort of got the cut heavy are our, are our heaviest line weights and they're 0.2 of a millimeter in this case. Um, you know, I could always tweak them. If I was doing this for printing rather than for screen display, maybe I'd make them very slightly heavier. It depends on what size page. Um, my cut light lines, which are these ones, are 0.12 millimeters and my uncut lines a 0.06 millimeters. So those are my three main line weights. Um, so 0.2 for the heavy cut, 0.12 for the light cut, and 0.06 for the uncut lines. So you can sort of see each one is about twice as heavy as the one before. Um, there's a few other lines that I do. They're all black as well. Um, my overhead, lines are also black but I do them uh, they're 0.6 um, but they're dashed and I do a I do a two mil one mil dash on those um, my door swings are slightly different um, I do I actually do them gray rather than black so they're a 50 percent gray um, and because gray reads as thinner, as lighter than black, I bump the line weight on those up, up to 0.08, just a little bit. You know, probably not necessary, but what I find is if I zoom out, if I don't do that, my door, my door swings start to disappear visually when I look at it as a whole. Fine when I zoom in, but they, they disappear when I zoom out, and I don't want that. Um, few other things you know my grid I do as a as a dot dash um, what else um, the markers I do slightly heavy heavier they're a point one um, oh and while we're looking at markers let's have a look at them again so this is the same set of markers I did in Rhino so I'll give them to you in Illustrator as well and this is just how it works. You know, your annotation is, a, is a, a leader line with an arrow and your annotation. Your section 
is like this, circle with a triangle. Um, I, it's pretty common to fill the outer triangle in black, um, just makes it a little easier to see on the page. Um, and this, what this is telling you, sometimes you'll only have one section marker if it's across the whole drawing. Other times, if you're only sectioning a small part, you'll have a start marker and an end marker. Um, the, what this is telling you is that the section which is being uh, marked on your plan, which in this case is here, so I'm, I'm cutting my section across the middle here, is found on sheet A102 and its drawing number is A. Typically sections use letters, they're a bit, they're a bit unusual. Um, elevations, whoops, I need to change these, that should say elevation, and that should say detail. So your elevation, no, sorry, that's, oh, I've missed the elevation marker. All right, I'll fix that. That's actually an internal elevation. Internal elevation. There we go. And the elevation marker is this one. Whoops. Elevation. Oops. Like I said, I'm making this up as I go along. Uh, so here's my elevation marker. Again, the elevation being referred to here is found on sheet A102. Um, I'm imagining that I'm probably going to have a, a, a drawing set which has maybe three, maybe four sheets. I haven't decided yet. Um, and I will change these numbers depending on where the various drawing ends up. But for now, I'm just saying, okay, my sections and elevation are going to be on sheet A102. This plan is probably A101, and my details are going to be on A103. So this is drawing E01 on sheet A102, and it is this whole front elevation, the section across the middle. Now, internal elevations, you guys will probably use a heap as interior architects. And what they're referring to, they, they do very much like an elevation, but they're often just referring to in, interior walls. You know, a, a, a regular rectangular room has four interior walls and you can draw an elevation for each one of those. So typically you would put a marker like this in the middle of the room and then this would say on sheet A103, drawing numbers one, two, three, four, refer to the north, east, south and west interior walls. Um, sometimes you will have walls at funny angles, so you might have a marker which only shows two walls, one that's diagonally up and one that's diagonally down, and sometimes you just want to show one interior elevation, in which case you can do it like that, or you can just use a marker which is more like a regular elevation, so this would be drawing 01 on sheet A101. And the reason I'm showing you this is because in, in somebody's uh, project, uh, in someone's assessment one, they did an interior door elevation and they used a section marker to show it. Um, I can't remember who it was, it doesn't really matter, but this is what you should do. So if I'm showing an, an interior elevation of this door, I put a marker in like this and you can sort of see exactly what's going on. It's pointing to this door face. And it tells me that on sheet A103, drawing number three is this door internal elevation. Um, 
the other markers are my detail markers. So I'm choosing to do, at the moment, two details. Um, I'm going to show one of these corners and one of these intermediate joints. Um, it may not be necessary to draw both of them, but I'm going to. Um, and what this means, I'm doing these as details because there's a lot going on here. And if I was annotating that here on this sheet, it would be a very dense piece of annotation with arrows going everywhere and it's going to be really confusing. So I'm choosing to pull this out as a larger scale detail and I'll do the annotation for these on that detail. So this is telling me that this detail is going to be pulled out as drawing one on sheet A103 and this one is drawing two on A103. Um, some other labels you may or may not want to use. Um, standard labels for doors, windows, skylights. So typically every door will have a door number so that you can refer to it in a door schedule. Windows are the same, skylights are the same. Um, so uh, in, in our case, we've got four doors, so they might be door one, door two, door three, door four. But because they're all the same, I'm not going to label them. Um, it's, it's just not necessary. Um, what you could do though, is because we have different window types, and again, I'm going to pull these windows out and do a detail of each one of them. Um, we could label the window types. We could have window privacy, window barred, window um, uh, uh, solid and window slatted. And I could put one of these markers next to, whoop, no, I could put one of these, no, solid, where's, uh, that's a slatted, where's a slatted, there's a slatted. So I could put a window slatted there and a window slatted there. Um, you probably want to try and put them in the same place on each window. It's a bit tricky. It's a bit tight. Um, and then, you know, here I would put window solid, window slatted, window slatted. They're all window slatted. Those two are window privacy and these are window solids. Um, up to you whether you want to do that or not. Uh, I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to do that. I might do it, but I'll see how much room I've got. Other things I'm showing on here are my falls. So I've got a fall to the outside edge and a fall to the garden, depending on where on the slab I am. I have a room label. So each room in the building has a, uh, a room name label. So in this case, female restaurant, restroom. And typically when I label my rooms, I always specify usually in a, a bold font. So it's really easily readable when you stand back. I label the name of the room and then in a not bold font, I put the material that the floor is. So the floor finish in this room is concrete type one. Uh, and that conch one will have an entry into my both my legend and then I'll have a materials schedule. And I don't expect you guys to have a material schedule, but um, at some point I might show you one just so that you know what they look like. And I put the finished floor level. Um, so in this case, the finished floor level is 76.6 meters. And you'll see I've done this for each of the rooms. I've also done it out here and I've called this open area the atrium and I've called this area here the entry and that's because this floor slab here is a different type of concrete. If you look at it in the photos it's got little pebbles and things in it so it looks different. So I've called that conk 2, so concrete type 2 and I've made this label to distinguish and it's kind of important here to where you have two different slabs meeting to make sure you put the finished floor level. In, in our case, they're the same, but sometimes there might be a step down or a step up there that those will tell you about. Um, I've also labeled my garden beds. Um, in terms of just general labels, 
um, I tend to use two or three letter codes. So in this case, WC for, stands for water closet, sort of an archaic name for, for a toilet. Now, there are actually two types of toilet in this project. There's these regular type toilets, which I've called WC1, but in the accessible restroom, it's, it's got a, an extended toilet, and I've called that WC2. There's also some accessible handrails and supports around there that I haven't shown. Uh, similarly with the stainless steel basins, I have um, basin one plus TS1, which is tap set one, which is in, this, this is the smaller basin in the accessible restroom. And then I have BA2 and TS2 for tap set two, uh, which are the bigger basins that are out in. And you'll see this one's also BA, BA2 and TS2. And again, those codes would link into a schedule of fittings. So it would specify the details of the sink, the manufacturer and model of the tap, any, any particular finish that I want on it, that sort of stuff. Um, so we've got that. Uh, annotations, you'll see I've done them like this. I just have my note here, arrow pointing to, in this case, the stall door, just saying stall doors. So we've got what it is. We've got, um, whoops. So um, uh, the size, the material, the finish, gloss white paint finish, the fixing, stainless steel pivot hinges, hinges that are screw fixed to the wall studs. Um, and this is, this is still incomplete. You know, with the, with the mirrors here, I've got back-to-back -back laminated eight millimeter toughened glass mirrors in a timber frame. Now, you, you guys don't know exactly what that is. Um, I don't know how thick it is either, but I've got a, experience tells me it's, this is probably likely. Uh, you know, it might not be that thick. Maybe there's a timber piece, like maybe they're, they're thinner mirrors laminated to a piece of plywood. Uh, I don't know, but that's what I've decided to label it. Um, TSH is timber shelf, and that will be in my legend. Um, UR is urinal, so I've drawn the little urinal in there in the men's restroom. Um, there's, there's probably some more to go on. Uh, DP is a downpipe. Um, and in this case, it's a 150 millimeter copper downpipe. Um, this is a, a radial dimension, or in this case, a diameter. So this is telling me that my garden bed is 2650 millimeters across. You can see I've shown my inner extent of roof dashed over, outer extent of roof dashed over, all of those sorts of things. Um, these two lines that I've put on here, I've, you'll see I've labeled with this symbol, that's a symbol for a center line. And that just tells me that those are my, those are my axes of symmetry on this project. Those are the center lines. Then you, you don't necessarily have to do that, but I like to do it. Um, and I've got my A, B, C, D, E, F grid lines and my one, two, three, four, five. Oh, I need to relabel that, that one's wrong. So that should be three, four, five. Um, like I said, it's a work in progress. Um, and I also have my drawing label here. So this is going to be my GA plan. GA stands for general arrangement. It's at one to 20 when printed on an A1 sheet. Now, I'm going to take this drawing ultimately into um, Adobe InDesign. And I've put this label on here to show you, but I think what I would probably do is I'll leave that label off and put all of those labels on in InDesign because I'm, I, you know, I want to be able to arrange them and change them. So for now, I've just put it in here. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, room labels I've talked about, markers I've been through. Um, oh, I need to put my North Point on. Um, okay, I haven't put that on yet because I didn't bring it in with this, but I need, I will put my North Point on here somewhere. Um, again, that might go on in InDesign. Um, the trick is to remember to put it on. Um, a couple of things you might notice. I've used a light gray fill on my heavy cuts and a very light gray fill on my light cuts. 
and uh, I, I just think that helps helps them stand out as cut elements when you stand back. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? Tell me in the next tutorial. Um, what else? Um, you'll see with my dimensions, I haven't dimensioned heavily on here. Uh, I've, I'm going to bring the dimensions in for all of the interior bits and pieces later. So I've just dimensioned my grid lines at the moment, um, which is nice and clean. It means I don't have any leader lines on here. But when I get in here, I'll do my dimensions internally and I'll just make sure to pull my leaders, like I keep telling you, back away from everything. Um, I'll only dimension my horizontal things in plan. So, you know, it'll only be distances measured horizontally. All my vertical distances will go on the section. Um, I'm planning on doing a detail for an, an inner wall module and an outer wall module. So I'll have a separate detail for those and I'll do most of my dimensioning for the wall module on that. And by doing that, it just helps me keep this drawing relatively uncluttered. Um, now, that's probably enough, though I'll show you one last trick. Um, and this is something you can sort of do. It's, it's a bit of a cheap trick, but you know, it, it, it kind of looks nice. And that is you can add a shadow layer. Uh, and that is an image that sits behind all of your line work like this which suddenly gives everything a whole bunch of depth. Now, um, probably not something you would normally do in a construction drawing, but for a presentation drawing, um, I think you'll agree it looks pretty nice. Um, now that layer, um, I've brought in and I've turned the opacity right down um, if I dial the opacity up to 100, you'll see it's too intense. But, and if I make it sort of 10, it's probably just a little bit too light. 20, 20 is not bad. I don't know. I'm, I'm finding I'm liking 25. Um, and if I go into presentation mode, you'll see. And that's, this is how my drawing will look on the page. Um, and I think that reads pretty nicely for, 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 you know, for a studio presentation drawing. Now that shadow layer came out of Rhino and I'll show you how I got that. So let's toss that to one side, bring back Rhino. So Rhino has a bunch of display modes that I'm sure you're aware of. Um, you know, this is wireframe mode, there's the shaded mode, you know, there's various others, some rendered modes, whatever else. But there is, there's one mode which does, uh, no, not artistic. Oh God, that's going to take forever. Um, no, we don't want that. That's horrible. Arctic is the one. And basically that just uses a technique called ambient occlusion to give just a sort of vague shadows to give you a sense of depth. Um, it's, it's a general render layer that's, you know, like stuff that's in corners tends to be a bit shadowed. So where there's a corner that the sun doesn't get to or light doesn't get to, you see a bit of a shadow. Now, um, what we want to do when we're creating this is we want to turn off all our line work and we want to enable our, uh, clipping plane, but you'll see, so that's more or less what I want. Um, if you, we zoom in though, you can see it's still got all my clipping lines. And because I have in Illustrator all those lines drawn super nice, I don't want these black lines in here. So what I have to do is I have to go into the Rhino preferences, go to display modes and find the Arctic display mode and I make a copy of it. So I'll just make another, I've already done this, but I'll make another copy of it to show you. So I'll make an Arctic copy 
and then I'll call that something like, you know, Arctic 4 Shadow Render. So Arctic 4 Shadow Render. And then under Objects, uh, I want to turn off my show edge under clipping plane objects. I want to turn off show edges and that will turn off those black lines. Now, the other thing you might want to do is go to shadows and I like to dial uh, the shadow quality up to max and give it a soft edge clean artifacts and everything else is fine shadow intensity yep that's all fine and now when I go back and I select the mode we just created which should appear under here so here Arctic for shadow render we're gonna do it yes there we go see how much cleaner it is and we don't have the lines so you know if I if I zoom in uh, all right well, turning all of this on will slow your machine down a bit so try and line it up before you turn on this mode or um, the easiest other thing is to do is line it up when you're just in like a wireframe view dump, 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 dump zoom in to, to you know the size you want I'm just going to zoom in so that you can see what it looks like up close and now I'll turn that mode back on again uh, render to shadows no oh, that's not the one I want do, do, do. no that's horrible go away Oof. What did I call it? Arctic for plan. There we go. There we go. So now we want to save this out as an image that we can then drag into our Illustrator file and sit underneath all the line work. So the way we do that is there's a command called, um, well, first of all, we need to frame frame it up so let's just go back to wireframe zoom out so that we can fit it all on the screen go back to that mode Arctic for plan and then there's a command called view capture to file and essentially that's like doing a screenshot but you can specify the resolution. So it's a little bit, little bit nicer than a screenshot. So uh, I'm just gonna say resolution viewport for now, which is fine. I don't wanna show any of this other stuff. I just wanna save it. It'll tell you where, where do you wanna save it. ATS CAD model illustrator and save as view capture and I'll click save and then when I go into here oh, hang on when I go view capture to file so that's what it is I save as a PNG if you save it as a JPEG it's not as clean a PNG file is a much cleaner file and then I get Illustrator back and I can literally just drag that onto Illustrator now you'll have to then resize it um, it'll probably come in too big and then it's just a sort of a fiddly process of, um, you know, just sort of moving around going, is that too small? Uh, generally start with the opacity at, at 100. 
uh, grab the image so that's a little bit big um, remember to hold the shift key down when you resize otherwise it distorts see how it gets squashed so but if you hold the shift key down it maintains its aspect ratio and resizes nicely so we want it a bit smaller uh, no, now it's a bit too small so we need to go a bit bigger and put it back and a bit bigger and it's just this fiddling around until it sits pretty perfectly a tiny tiny bit bigger until it sits a tiny bit bigger It's not quite right, but until it sits under your line work at the right size and then turn the opacity right down. Um, you could then, oops, you might want to crop it uh, or not, but that, that then gives you that shadow layer. So, you know, without it, it's, it's still a nice clean plan but with it, it's like, oh, now I can really see that that's set down from the slab. I can see my slab edges nicely. I can see my rooms nicely. Um, up to you, but you know, it, it's a neat, it's a neat trick. Um, and it's you know whether or not you use it on this project or whether you save that for a uh, you know a future studio drawing or not, up to you. Um, but I think that's probably enough for now. Um, I might talk a little bit more about this and talk about things like title blocks and whatnot in class on Wednesday. But um, if I don't stop now, I'll never get this finished. All right, uh, hopefully this was of some help to you. Um, and I'll see you all Wednesday. Bye.